Members, we will resume question time once more, and it's time now for questions to the Minister for Employment and Learning. And I call Mrs. Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number one, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the most recent published statistics show that, as of the 30th of April 2014, uh, 481 employed apprentices in the South Antrim consistency are being funded through my department's Apprenticeship NI programme to undertake the off-the-job training element of their apprenticeship. Of these, uh, 250 are targeted to achieve Level 2 qualifications and 231 are targeted to achieve Level 3 qualifications. Apprenticeship qualifications are, are outlined in apprenticeship frameworks for each occupational area. The age dis distribution is as, as, is as follows, 192 between 16 and 19 years old, uh, 222 between 20 and 24 years old, and 60, 67 is 25 years or older. Um, the member will also be aware that I published a new strategy for apprenticeships securing our success in June 2014. This outlines a significant new approach to apprenticeships to be introduced in Northern Ireland between now and 2016. This will be central to our transforming, the, our, our transforming of, the, of the skills landscape in Northern Ireland and securing our economic success. Evidence shows that apprenticeships provide an excellent means by which employers can obtain the skills they require, as well as being assured that, that there is a critical mass of people with strong technical and employability skills across the economy. Apprentices know they are getting the skills that they require by employers and also uh, are relevant to the economy, both now and in the future. I call Pam Cameron for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer, uh, his very full answer. Um, but ask the Minister, does he believe that enough is actually being done to promote on-the-job training for young people who are exiting uh, formal, the formal education system? Well, the Member is right that Northern Ireland is, is starting from a relatively small base in terms of apprenticeships, not some, somewhat goes against what people would have viewed as the industrial heritage uh, in, in Northern Ireland. Um, but obviously the new strategy is set to change the landscape uh, dramatically in this regard. And, uh, a number of the key interventions in include a new uh, advisory uh, forum, uh, which, will be, which will include employers and other, other key stakeholders to look at the, the system as a whole, and also a range of sectoral partnerships, uh, which will try to drive uh, apprenticeships within particular sectors, including uh, drawing attention to opportunities uh, for, for employers. And already we're working on potentially five uh, new sectoral partnerships, um, and uh, hopefully there'll be more uh, announcements in that regard in, in the very near future. Critically, we're also looking to introduce for the first time in Northern Ireland a central service uh, which will almost like act as a, as a brokerage for both employers and potential young people so we can have a much more efficient matching of uh, supply and demand. Uh, but I think critically, there's a lot that we can do outside those structures, uh, whether it's MLAs or other opinion formers, to highlight the importance of the apprenticeship pathway as being a strong alternative to the more traditional academic pathways that people perhaps are more familiar with. I call Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, has his department, or is it involved in doing studies that looks at the number of pupils and then those that are moving on to uh, higher or skills training and apprenticeship training from Antrim who are moving out to Newton Abbey, to Belfast, and at the same time having to travel away from their schools to look at how we can do it better in Antrim so that we use the schools all working together with the technical colleges and maybe one day get everything back into Antrim again? Well, I, I'm certainly uh, keen uh, to ensure that we develop uh, the capacity uh, around apprenticeships and indeed vocational training, not just in Antrim, but uh, in every quarter uh, and every corner of Northern Ireland. Um, and I think, that, that particularly with reference to South Antrim, uh, there, are, there is a critical mass of uh, good employers who are interested in uh, apprenticeships and those who are already engaged uh, in that regard. Um, there will be times, however, where people will move out of the uh, different, uh, different areas, other parts of Northern Ireland, for work opportunities, and that also applies uh, to apprenticeships. And it is important that we do uh, encourage uh, labour mobility and recognise that it is part and parcel of the modern world uh, of, of work. Uh, that is matched by, of course, ensuring that we, we do, and do, do what we can to invest uh, within uh, local uh, capacity. Uh, I can certainly write to the member and give me any information we have in terms of inflows and outflows in terms uh, of, of apprentices. Uh, but I, I, would, I wouldn't describe it as being an un unhealthy situation that we have that, as long as we are providing the right opportunities and getting the right level of engagement from both employers and young people uh, within Northern Ireland as a whole, we should be pleased with that. Questions 2, 4 and 10 have been withdrawn, so I call Fergal McKinney. Deputy Speaker, question number 3. 
Uh, the transfer of contracted staff engaged in the, de the delivery of the Steps to Work programme to the subcontractors involved in the delivery of the Steps to Success, of steps to success is a matter between the respective organisations. This transfer process is subject to the Transfer of Undertakings Protection of Employment, known as GUPI, which is a defined legal procedure. The Department is not directly involved in this process. I call Fergal McKinney for supplementary. Uh, nonetheless, um, we're just trying to establish some information. And could you outline how many of the most successful contractors and subcontractors under Steps to Work will be the supply chain under Steps to Success? Um, well, I'm happy to uh, provide that information uh, to, to the member. Uh, it's actually quite detailed in terms of that. All of, all of the, the information is, is currently on uh, the department's uh, website, uh, but I'll also make sure my officials uh, uh, write to him in that regard to, to give him the full, the full details. But in terms of, of headlines, I mean, we have the three main contractors, which are Indius uh, for the Belfast region, uh, EOS for the northern region, and Reading Partnership for uh, the, the southern region. Um, Given that the member is, is uh, a Belfast uh, MLA, uh, in terms of the supply chain specifically for Belfast, uh, we have uh, Armstrong Learning NI, uh, People First, Springfield Learning, uh, SES Consortium, and Addiction NI. I call Mike Nesbitt. Uh, just to thank you, Deputy Speaker. Just to continue the theme, uh, can I ask, as a Northern Ireland Minister in the Northern Ireland Executive, which puts the Northern Ireland economy first, uh, what is the Minister doing to maximise Northern Ireland job creation out of the scheme? Well, the, the scheme is designed to assist us uh, with employability uh, within uh, our labour market and as part, therefore, of a much wider uh, landscape in terms of what my department offers uh, in terms of supporting uh, job creation and ensuring that we have a strong uh, skills uh, pipeline. Uh, already we have had discussion, for example, around uh, apprenticeships uh, and we have a new strategy in place. Uh, shortly we will be making a statement in relation to uh, a new system of youth training which will complement uh, apprenticeships. Uh, we have our more established routes through uh, universities and further education colleges, albeit there is a, a question mark over the scale of, of the future offer in light of the, the budget uh, restrictions. But a, a, a number of our, our other programmes are about uh, how we can re-engage people with the labour market, and that includes people who are perhaps economically inactive, or in the, in the case of Steps to Success, those who are uh, long-term uh, unemployed. We have designed this, this programme specifically for Northern Ireland. We have not simply copied the work programme uh, from uh, Great Britain, and indeed I, I hope we will do things better here mm -hmm. and have a stronger uh, track record in terms of placing people into sustained employment, and that's what this is ultimately about. I call Phil Slanningen. I'll ask you and Corny, and thank to thank the Minister for his answers. He'll be aware that I'm not exactly a fan of this scheme. Um, but can I ask the Minister, given that the, the first thing this scheme has done is to put a significant number of people on the dole, is there anything to stop these people from applying for a programme through the Steps to Success scheme? Well, I think that the member is being somewhat flippant uh, with the comment uh, that, that he is making. And uh, I would ask him the question, uh, if he is dissatisfied with the, the current programme, what is his alternative? Uh, I uh, will be charitable and assume that the member does want to assist people who, who are uh, long-term unemployed into to, to employment. Uh, what we are seeking to do is to build upon the track record of steps to work uh, with a new and improved uh, programme through which we get a better return on, on employment. Um, as I have said, in, ter in terms of my main answer, um, CHUPE uh, will be applied in terms of, of the, the, the shift uh, between a contract um, that has still to work fully out, um, but there is a protection of employment that is integral uh, to, to all of that. So I don't recognise the comment he makes about vast numbers of people being uh, made unemployed uh, on the back of this uh, switch between programmes. Moving on, I call Daki Mackay. Case number two, question number five. Um, JTI are currently engaged in a consultation process with trade union and staff to discuss the potential closure of its factory at Lisnafilla in Ballymena. I have met with representatives from JTI Gallagher to discuss their recent announcement and the ways in which my department could assist. The European Globalisation Adjustment Fund supports workers made redundant as a result of major structural changes in world trade patterns due to, due to globalisation and global uh, financial and economic crises. My officials have been in contact with the, with the European Commission Office in Belfast and the Commission in Brussels to discuss the potential for an application to be, to be made to this fund. All applications must be agreed by Member State Government. Therefore, my department has also initiated discussions with relevant officials in the Department for Working Pensions. My department will continue to liaise with the Commission and the UK Government. 
Regardless of the success of any bid to the European Globalisation Adjustment Fund, my department will provide a range of services if required through, through the Redundancy Advice Service, the Career Service, Bridge to Employment and through the further education sector, in particular, in particular Northern Regional College. I will ensure that my department does everything that it can uh, to assist those affected by, re by the recent announcement and will continue to work with the company throughout this process. I call back Amy Mackay for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. And obviously, uh, depending on the outcome of those talks between the employees uh, and Gallagher's, uh, following on from that, uh, you know, €6 million Euro was drawn down, for example, in Austria in terms of this specific fund. Uh, but we are dependent uh, on the Westminster Government being positive in terms of this application, should it be forthcoming. Can the Minister outline how positive the British Government have been in terms of this fund? Because they haven't drawn down any of this funding before. And can I also ask, in terms of the, real, the possible reallocation of jobs, uh, what uh, discussions he has had, uh, along with the Enterprise Minister, with other uh, manufacturing companies in the, area, in the wider area, in terms of the possible reallocation of those jobs? I'll allow the, member, the Minister to choose which question he may answer. Members should be reminded they are allowed to ask a question. Minister. Indeed, the member did uh, pack, pack a lot in there, but um, I, I will try, try to cover um, a number of the points made because uh, it is a, a very uh, serious issue uh, and uh, I think it does deserve a, as full an explanation as possible. Um, let me first of all say, in terms of the last point he makes, um, I chair um, a, a manufacturing uh, and engineering working group. Indeed, we, we had our, our last meeting at Caterpillar in Larne, and at that point we did highlight the the potential opportunities uh, that um, would be available um, within, within the wider sector. But turning to the first point that the member makes, it is worth stressing the point that we are currently in a consultation period, so final decisions have yet to be taken as to what is, is going to happen. Secondly, the timescale with respect to any redundancies is actually going to be around 18 months or so, and production uh, does need to continue in terms of the factory. And if, if anything, production may intensify over the coming months as the, the factory uh, seeks uh, to uh, maximise uh, what it produces in, in terms of the current uh, regulatory uh, framework. Uh, in terms of the attitude of the UK government, the members are uh, quite right uh, in terms of the fact that they have never. Uh, uh, to this date, um, supported any application uh, to, to the fund, uh, but there is always a first time, and uh, we will be strongly making the case uh, if, if the case is, is appropriate. That one of the key determinants has to be a situation where there is, in effect, a net, a net loss of jobs in, within the context of the European Union, in the context where the jobs out of Balamina are being relocated to elsewhere in the European Union. There is no let, net loss of jobs within the EU, so those jobs would not be eligible for support uh, from the fund. But in terms of the net loss of jobs plus jobs within the supply chain, then there is a potential uh, application that can be made. I have raised the issue with, with the executive, and uh, there is uh, cross-party support uh, for the, the work being done uh, with the DWP and indeed the Commission uh, to prepare the ground for a bid, which can only be made uh, in the teeth of the actual redundancies themselves. I call Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister refers to the 18-month timeline in regard to the, the factory closure. Will the Minister give assurances to this House and to the workers that he and his department will be still there in 18 months' time to ensure that these workers are upskilled and retrained and that they won't disappear into the night once the glare of the PR and the cameras go? Well, I, I can't uh, perhaps give a, a personal guarantee about myself, given uh, our current uh, political situation. Uh, but what I can say, as long as I'm in post, and I'm sure this applies to any successor uh, within uh, my department uh, in any context, that this will be a, a, a priority. Uh, I think it is fair to say that this, this uh, issue uh, is a concern right across all of the political parties, and I think there is a, a general consensus on a range of steps that we do need to take in this regard. Um, I have certainly met uh, with um, the, the, both uh, representatives of the unions and indeed uh, management in terms of, of the factory. We do have to respect the fact that the consultation is underway and also that we do not don't, don't wish to interfere with production in the factory. Some of the st stuff that we can do, however, is uh, advanced planning around some of the retraining programmes, and that is where uh, Northern Regional College uh, comes into its own as a key uh, delivery partner. And we can also do the groundwork in terms of any bid uh, to the European Commission and potentially have something in draft form, uh, which is unofficially uh, cleared in advance of of a formal application uh, that, again, can only be made technically uh, in the context of the, uh, of the actual redundancies becoming live. 
I call John Dallet. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm trying to get my head around all this thing. The Minister tells us that production might well even increase over the next couple of years. What protection is given to workers who want to leave early and avail of their redundancy payments and so on? Has the Minister got assurances from uh, GTI that they will be flexible and will afford every opportunity to those employees to leave early if they so wish and another job is available and they don't lose all the perks they have worked hard for over the years? Well, I think we, we do need to be fair uh, to the company in this regard. And first of all, recognise that they didn't have to make these announcements uh, in the timescale that they have done. So, uh, a present of the law in Northern Ireland dictates a, a 90-day consultation in relation to redundancy of, of this size. So, in theory, they could have waited uh, until um, the start of 2016 uh, to, to make this public. Um, the fact they have moved early um, allows us uh, to engage in a lot of, of planning around this, and that gives us some vital uh, breathing space. But, but I think the last thing we want to do is to undermine uh, the current business model uh, of the factory, and again to stress the fact that we are still in the consultation period and no final decisions have been taken in this regard. So we need to be careful about assuming things are, are, are done daily in, in, in this respect as well. Um, there is a formal process around, around redundancy, and that is a process that I think has to be respected uh, in, in this. Uh, but I think the fact that good warning has been given is to the advantage of both workers and indeed government in terms of how we can best address this with proper long-term planning. I call Fra McCann. I'll ask Con Cooley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Cash uh, Everest Shea, question six. My department does not have policy responsibility for matters uh, relating to the introduction of a living wage and has not held any discussions with the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills on this issue. I call Fra McCann. Fra I understand uh, that recently Belfast City Council has uh, passed a motion on the implement, uh, implementing a living wage, and given this is Living Wage Week, and given that we la live in a low-pay economy, uh, could the Minister uh, assure us uh, that he will take up the mantle of pushing for a living wage for low paid workers? Well, what I am prepared to say to the member is that, on a volu voluntary basis, I am happy to encourage uh, any employer uh, to pay uh, the living wage. I think all of us will want to see uh, people getting as much money in their pockets as they possibly can. Where I think we need to be somewhat cautious is around a, a degree um, of compulsion or making something, something like this mandatory. The best way to drive up uh, wage levels within an economy is to invest in skills and on the back of that to achieve a, a gain in, in productivity. And that will, will lead to a natural increase in, in, in wage levels. Um, if you artificially um, set uh, the, the bar in that regard um, at a, a too high a level, the potential is there that you actually undermine jobs and jobs are removed from, from the economy and more people end up in unemployment. So it's, a, it's important that we approach this in a responsible and balanced manner. And that's why I stress that the voluntary uh, adherence to, the, to, to, the, to the, the, what the Living Wage Commission are saying uh, based upon the, the particular characteristics uh, of, of businesses. Uh, we do need to bear in mind that there are a, a large number of people in Northern Ireland who do, who do, live, uh, do earn below the living wage uh, threshold. Now, on the one hand, people may say that uh, is a very clear example as to why we have to stress the importance of people being paid the living wage. Equally, it actually exposes that within the structure of our economy at present, uh, there, there may well be a danger if we move too far too fast in, in, in this regard. So that's why, again, I, I would urge a degree of caution in, in this matter. I'm also mindful that we have a large number of employment programmes in which we, we, we pay subsidies to employers to take people on who are either unemployed or in the future potentially uh, economically inactive. And again, if we are, are setting mandatory levels uh, in excess of what is the market rate in that, in that regard, uh, we may end up in a situation where our ability to move people from, from unemployment into sustained employment is compromised. So again, that's another uh, factor that we have to con take into consideration. Chris Hazard is not in his place. I call Sammy Wilson. Question number eight. The latest employer skills survey from 2013 reported that Northern Ireland had the lowest level of skills shortage vacancies across the UK. The report found that approximately 20% of all vacancies that Northern Ireland employers found hard to fill were in part due to skills shortages. While this was the lowest level reported, it still had an impact on employers' ability to run their business. 
My Department um, has detailed in our skills strategy has a clear mission to address these skill issues through ensuring that the supply of skill matches demand from industry. Our skill solutions advisors have a, key, have a key role in engaging directly with employers to understand and address their skill needs. Uh, furthermore, I have worked with employers to establish a number of working groups across key sectors, including ICT, advanced engineering and manufacturing, and food and drink processing, uh, to address particular skill ne uh, needs in, in sectors. We have also uh, developed uh, a new uh, programme of apprenticeships, uh, and uh, we are currently uh, exploring a new system of youth training. We are also engaging the Northern Ireland Centre for Economic Policy to develop a skills barometer, which will provide useful information to identify where skills development will be required in the future. I call Sammy Wilson for supplementary. Does the Minister share my alarm that some sectors are reporting that up to 40% of firms are indicating that growth potential is being hampered because of skill shortages, and especially in the engineering sector, given that this is engineering week? What action has he taken along with DETI and employers to get employers to go into schools, colleges, universities to change the perception that many young people have of the opportunities that exist within the engineering industry? Well, I respond to the member in two, in two respects. First of all, uh, very specifically in terms of, of engineering. Um, I chair, as I mentioned, a, a working group um, on engineering and advanced manufacturing, which brings together uh, colleges, universities, uh, government departments, uh, and indeed a range of employers. And we have an action plan in place. And a number of the actions the member has identified um, are contained within that action plan. That's something that we uh, review and refresh uh, on a sixth uh, mo monthly basis. Um, more generally. Um, the member will also be aware that uh, Brian Ambrose has chaired uh, an expert panel that was appointed by myself and John O'Dowd uh, to take forward a review of careers policy. We have now received the, that, that report and are, are studying it. And again, um, whether we are talking about the, the engineering sector or other key sectors within the economy, uh, the recommendations of that report will hopefully go a long way in terms of ensuring that we uh, lay the platform and foundation for a much better matching of supply and demand within our economy. Called Pat Ramsey. Speaker, following through from Mr. Wilson's question, could I ask the Minister, I recently visited a very successful jobs fair in the Millennium Forum in the city, and there clearly was a number of companies who were experiencing difficulty securing skills from, from people in the city. What discussions has the Minister had with Invest Northern Ireland, or what really is the outcomes of the job fairs in terms of preparing and, and looking at lessons learned? In terms of the, of the jobs fairs th themselves, I mean, they are uh, an effective tool in terms of, of matching um, those who are looking for work with those th that do have uh, vacancies. And, uh, I mean, just to put this in context, the, the most recent jobs fair we hosted in Belfast, we, uh, were, we had potentially about 1,500 vacancies uh, 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 available and several thousand people are, are coming through the doors and people are, are actually leaving uh, with either job offers or potential formal interviews for jobs. So it's producing results in that context. Beyond that, the member was also alluding to which, I mean, wider strategic discussions that we can have uh, around issues, and he mentioned Invest in Northern Ireland. Um, my department runs a programme called Assured Skills, um, which works alongside Invest NI in terms of uh, attracting in inward investment and also working uh, with, the local, uh, co with local companies as well. And we put in place very bespoke programmes um, to, to move from what is a very good generally trained population to ensure we are investing in the very particular skills uh, that companies require. And the mem member will be familiar with a number of academies in areas such as software testing, cloud computing, data analytics, uh, and most recently this week uh, around that sales and export uh, that we have put in place uh, to address some of the very particular requirements and demands that are being voiced to us by industry. I call Anna Lowe. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister give an assessment uh, on how the budget cut for next year for his department uh, may affect his efforts in uh, training uh, in skill training in order to meet the skill shortage in Northern Ireland? Well, I thank the member for, for her question. And I mean, we've heard a lot of comment, commentary around the importance of, of, of job creation. And I think it's important that I stress that job creation comes in, in a number of, of different ways. But at, at its base, has to be a, a strong, strong skills base. 
in, in Northern Ireland. That is how we go out and sell Northern Ireland internationally to potential inward investors. It is how we ensure that uh, our own local companies uh, are able to grow. There is an ongoing challenge of ensuring that we match supply and demand, which is at the heart of the original question, uh, and uh, ensure that we are investing in the most relevant areas uh, for uh, the businesses of the future. Um, but I do have some very real concerns that on the back of the, uh, the recent dr announced draft budget uh, that the, the inevitable cuts that we will see in terms of uh, both higher education and further education will see a, the removal of places which not only undermines the life opportunities of young people, but will also corrode our economic base. And at a time when we are emerging at long last from a very difficult and deep recession, and also when we have the potential to grow our economy through levers such as the lower level of corporation tax, that we won't be able to fully maximise the opportunities if we don't have a proper skills base. Um, we're, we're, we're potentially looking at a situation now where Northern Ireland will be the only part of the Western world that's going backwards in terms of the number of university places. And that, I don't think that's a place where any of us want to be. Moving on, I call Rosalind Corley. Um, um, I share the aspirations of John Keeney, the Commissioner for Public Appointments, for greater diversity on the boards for our public bodies. It is concerning that many seem to think that a public appointment is not isn't for them. Unless a board reflects fully the breadth of knowledge, skills and experience within the wider community, its full potential and effectiveness may not be, real, be, be realised. Public appointments in my department are decided on the basis of a robust merit-based system which complies with the Commissioner's Code of Practice and aims to identify the best person for the job. However, there is scope for it to continue to improve diversity through effective awareness raising of what public appointments are and how individuals can apply, and by ensuring that the process is an accessible one. My officials have taken various steps to enhance diversity, such as using social media to publicise competitions, engaging with diversity bodies, and clarifying and streamlining, streamlining the, the application process. This indeed has had some success. Uh, for example, recent com competitions attracted twice as many applicants as previously and a more diverse pool of applicants. However, more can be done. Uh, my officials are currently comp compiling information on best practice throughout these islands with a view to identifying new ways to broaden interest in public appointments. They are also working with the NICS co uh, colleagues on taking forward the recommendations in John Keeney's diversity report published earlier on this year. I call Rosalind McCorley for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, I appreciate the answer given by the Minister, but would he not accept that, given that um, in public appointments across the board in the North, only 464 are women out of a total of 1,400? And in that context, would he not consider then looking at more um, outside the box ways of um, being? Uh, assured that diversity is actually the case, rather than just paying lip service? Go my yogurt. Member, for, for, for the question, I, mean, I, mean, I sh share the, the aspirations and objectives that she has outlined. Um, ultimately, appointments have to be based upon merit, not right at the core in terms of the, of the code. Um, and gender issues, um, like other uh, factors, cannot be taken in, into consideration in terms of the, the, the final merit-based decisions. The key probably lies in terms of ensuring that we have a, a, as representative a pool as we possibly can, which means uh, maximising applications that will come in uh, from women, but also under other, other representative sections of, of society. I am pleased that uh, we have seen an increase in terms of applications within my department, so some of the, the different ways of, of, uh, of trying to, pr to promote this are, uh, are having an effect, but obviously more can be done. I am happy to always learn lessons in, in this regard, and I have asked my officials to, to keep working away on that. In that, on that matter, and uh, no doubt we will, across the different departments within the government, uh, share best practice and lessons that we can pick up along the way. I call Dominic Bradley. Bradley. <laughs> <laughs> No Dini uh, O Vinli Etnacha er in the board stach. Eh, Anyani and Tara Kinchide, Nach Marshina Ves, Lelindo Vena Ara. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask uh, the Minister, um, 
In relation to uh, women, as was mentioned earlier on, people under 30 years of age, people with a disability and people from ethnic minorities, these people are rarely appointed to uh, boards. Uh, will the Minister ensure under his watch that changes in this respect will be made? And can I ask the Minister to make a brief response? Yes. <laughs> And that is the end of our time for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. A number of the questions have been withdrawn, questions number five and six, and I now call Megan Fearon. Can I ask the Minister what work his department carries out with agencies in the rest of Ireland to improve employment opportunities for people in the border corridor? Well, um, we are developing, as the member knows, a number of, of programmes, uh, in particular uh, a new strategy on apprenticeships and uh, also uh, youth training. Um, we have uh, made, uh, we've had discussions between my officials and counterparts uh, in the Republic of Ireland around those and, in particular, uh, issues around uh, mobility. Um, the member will also be aware that, um, particularly within uh, Northern Ireland, uh, we provide a large number of uh, further education places uh, from, for uh, students who actually come from the, the Republic of Ireland. Um, I have to say that this is uh, a very much a one uh, way in terms of the, the direction of travel, and uh, the, the net cost to the public person in Northern Ireland is, is in excess of £7 million. And this is becoming a major drain in terms of our public resources, particularly at a time when finances are, are so uh, challenged. So I would say that from our perspective, uh, we're doing a lot to facilitate um, cooperation um, on both sides of the border in terms of training programmes. But I have to say that is not necessarily reciprocated in terms of the level of offer on the southern side of the border in terms of our uh, own residents uh, moving in that direction. I call Megan Stern for supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, obviously, it is hugely important that we focus on developing that border region, given that there's higher levels of job losses and higher levels of immigration and more bar barriers to trade. Um, but can I ask the Minister if he'd be willing to engage at some point with representatives of the steering group behind the Border Development Zone to explore ways that his department can um, support that concept? Yeah, I mean, if the, if the group uh, wished to make contact with my private, of, private office uh, and ask uh, for, for a meeting, I, I have no doubt that, that meeting would be re, uh, requested, uh, would, be, would be granted. Sorry, I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, given the failure of the DUP and Sinn Féin to uh, address the uh, budget inadequacies over the last four years, can you tell uh, the House today what the impact of the cuts in the 15-16 budget will have on your department? Well, the, as a member will know, the, the, the published uh, cut for my department uh, is 10.8% is, uh, with respect to the 15-16 financial year. Um, that does not, of course, take into account uh, changes in terms uh, of, of prices, so the real terms cut will be uh, in excess uh, of that. We also have to bear in mind that what happens in one year um, can't be viewed in isolation from other budget phases. And in particular, whenever we're making investments in terms of, of training places uh, where, and university places, uh, where there has to be a commitment over more than one um, academic or training year, um, we do need to have a, a much greater degree of, of certainty in, in this respect. Um, Already, I have alluded to the, to the fact that um, skills is the foundation stone of a strong economy, and that is true in Northern Ireland as much as anywhere else. Um, but perhaps it is even more true here because we, we have to transform our skills base uh, to ensure that we will be truly uh, competitive uh, globally. And uh, a lot has been done in, in that regard over the past uh, number, number of years. Uh, there are now some very real question marks over the scale in which we can continue to invest, particularly in terms of university places and also places in terms of further, edu further, further education colleges. Uh, that means that some young people may be denied opportunities to invest in their skills in their future. It also means that local companies and indeed potential investors uh, may be denied the opportunity uh, to get the skills that they require. And indeed, we may not see some businesses grow or some businesses come to Northern Ireland as a consequence of this. Mr Dixon for a supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. And given the, the, the shocking information which you have given to us about the inability to invest in young people's futures and their jobs, what steps are you going to take to mitigate against uh, that for uh, as many young people as possible? Well, well first of all, we're, we have to be conscious this is a, a draft budget which is out uh, for a public consultation. And 
concerns that I may voice around my own department isn't about special pleading um, from my own point of view and indeed the services that I provide. I mean, there are a whole host of other issues that we have to reflect upon in terms of, of the budget, and uh, that will be uh, reflected, no doubt, in terms of the responses that are received uh, from, from stakeholders. Um, looking inwards as well, um, I will, as far as possible, seek to act as strategically as possible, which means trying to protect, first and foremost, those areas that are most relevant uh, to the economy, and also to look to, the, to, to those services that we provide to those who are most vulnerable. However, in, in the context that we're, we're facing, trying to achieve those uh, objectives is going to be, going to be in, incredibly difficult. And there's also, I mean, I think a, a very deep fundamental lesson in, in all of this. I mean, part of the reason why we're, why we're in this difficulty is. Uh, a failure to, to address up to, to face up to the need to, uh, to to accept welfare reform. There's no point in simply in, investing in transfer payments to people uh, so that they have an adequate standard of living in terms of benefits. That is something we, we all we all share. But unless we're investing in training programmes. Uh, that allow people to invest in their skills uh, and to have a, a, the opportunity uh, to secure a, a job, then in effect we are actually condemning people uh, to a, a life on welfare rather than actually giving them the opportunities to play a more full, full role in terms of their own aspirations, in terms of our own society. And I think we are missing a, the, the much bigger picture in this regard in the way we are approaching things. I call Ian McRae. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, Given the Minister's answer to the previous question, can the Minister um, update the House on um, any plans that there are, if there are indeed any, for the Macrofelt campus of the Northern Regional College? Well, at, at this stage, there are no immediate plans for the, the Macrofelt um, campus of Northern Regional College. We are awaiting a, a business case uh, in, in relation to some capital re redevelopment. Um, there are probably three issues at, at, at stake in that regard. The, the future of the campus uh, in Larne, um, in terms of what, what happens there, not whether it, one is there or not, um, just in case the member for East Antrim uh, is uh, getting agitated. Um, this, the second issue is the future uh, provision in terms of Balamina, and then the third issue is the, the future provision in terms of the North Coast, uh, where we have existing campuses in terms of uh, Balamoni and uh, Coal Rain, and uh, that has been uh, the matter of uh, considerable interest from a number of his colleagues uh, from the respective constituencies there. Um, that uh, business case will hopefully be with us in terms of uh, January of, of, of uh, 2015, and we'll look to take decisions on the way forward as soon as we can afterwards. Ian McRae for supplementary. Um, I, I let the other constituencies deal with their own. Um, no doubt they will, but I think that the Minister is confirming that Macrofell Campus certainly isn't under any immediate threat, and um, I'd be happy if he could clarify that again. But given the fact that it does provide an excellent service, not just to those people that are part of the FE sector, but the, the work that they do in conjunction with the other um, local schools, um, you know, can the Minister at least give that clarity that, that it isn't under threat and there are no proposals in that regard? More than happy to give the member all the assurances he needs that there is no question mark hanging over Macrofell campus. I call George Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, could I, I ask the Minister uh, what, to outline what strategy is, is using to attract people from rural areas to avail of FE College courses? Um, well, the, the, building upon the, the uh, question from the, 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 the member's colleague a few minutes ago, um, you will be aware that we do have a, a large number of campuses uh, distributed across uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, and in some respects, uh, further education is better placed uh, to engage with what can be a, a very rural population uh, than is, uh, is the case in, in, in other parts of, of, of Northern Ireland. Um, it is ultimately for the FE colleges themselves uh, to, to market uh, their, their courses. One thing I would also draw to his attention is that within um, our um, higher education strategy that uh, we are uh, looking to see how we can actually place um, some outposts in terms of our universities uh, within the, the FE sector and we are looking to develop a number of pilots uh, in that regard uh, and hopefully there will be some clarity in that respect in the, over the coming months. I call George Robinson. Uh, can I ask the Minister, to, uh, would he agree that by promoting the gaining of qualifications we are increasing the employability? of people from all areas, urban and rural, and all age groups? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the member will, will, will also be aware that um, 
the Northern Ireland comes from quite a low base in terms of skills, uh, where historically we've, we've had uh, some people at the very top of the skills uh, ladder who do extremely well, but, but uh, we've also had a, a lot of people with either low uh, or no uh, qualifications, and I've no doubt that that is perhaps more acute in some r rural areas than, than elsewhere in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, so that message that he makes about investing in skills is, is crucial, and as we look to the future, more and more jobs will require a footprint in terms of higher level skills. Um, I mean, for example, we're projecting that um, by the year t uh, 2020, um, almost half of those in employment will need to be skilled to level four uh, or above. Whenever you're talking about those um, in terms of level two or above, you're talking well in excess of 80% of the population and will need to have that, that degree of, sk of skill level. And by contrast, the opportunities for those with either level one or no qualifications will be less than 10% at present. About 20% about of jobs are filled by people with that type of, of background. So you will see a much uh, diminishing uh, range of opportunities for people with, no, with that low skills or no qualifications over the coming years. So it's important that message is, is passed out. I call Sandra Overend. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And as another member from, from Mid Ulster has already questioned your local further education colleges uh, in my constituency in Mid Ulster are very concerned about how the budget cuts will impact upon them. Um, as one of the largest employers in the Tyrone and Fermanagh region, the South West College that just wrote to me a, a couple of days ago, um, they have fears that cuts will disable them from delivering the first class education and, and training that they currently do. Has the Minister received representation from the South West College? And, or is he in discussion with them? Well, what I can say to the member is, I mean, we're always in discussion uh, with uh, our further education um, colleges, and, and in particular um, the principals and chief, the chief executives. So those discussions uh, have been had and will continue uh, to be held. Um, and while uh, I was able to give reassurance perhaps to Mr McRae with respect to, to campuses uh, and uh, on, the ca on the capital uh, front, um, Equally, I have to be very blunt with the member that uh, we are looking at a very precarious situation in terms of, of further education, um, where the full current offer um, is going to have huge difficulties in terms of its maintenance, uh, and uh, all colleges will, will be facing up to what may be some very difficult decisions uh, over the coming months. And that's the simple reality that we find ourselves in whenever we're faced uh, with a potential budget cut in, in excess of 10%. Call Sandra Overham for supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for his response. But given that the South West College uh, delivers higher education locally to 1,600 students in a partnership with Queen's University, uh, does the Minister anticipate that such further education colleges might be given resources to increase uh, its capability in the face of cuts uh, to university places in order to maintain and, pr and uh, improve the skill set of our Northern Ireland people? Well, Perhaps building on the answers I, I gave to my colleague Mr Dixon and also to uh, Mr, Mr Robinson um, uh, just a few, few moments ago, I mean, we are very mindful of the need to focus um, on pr the provision of higher level skills within uh, our economy, and that includes both academic and vocational skills. Um, I'm also um, very mindful of the need to, to act uh, strategically in terms of how we uh, address uh, what are going to be uh, quite severe cutbacks. Uh, and in that respect, I have no doubt that the FE colleges will want to focus on the areas that are most relevant to the needs of the economy. Um, both generally and also in terms of their own uh, local re re sub-regional um, areas. Uh, within that, um, a higher education within further education is a key component of what uh, the, the, the college, colleges offer. And I have no doubt that, that while no area can be immune uh, from uh, the, the, the cutbacks on the way forward, that, that strategically that will be an area that people will wish to see um, given a degree of, of priority. I call David McElveen for, some, for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And, uh, in light of the Minister's budgetary pressures, which he has explained to, his, spent, explained to the House, uh, when is he going to tell St Mary's College to waken up and realise that we cannot have a split teacher training system that feeds inequality? Well, um, the member. Um may have missed uh, quite a lot of the things I've been saying over the past number of years uh, in relation to uh, the teacher training infrastructure in Northern Ireland. We have commissioned a, a two-stage review. The first stage has outlined uh, the financial implications of the fragmented system that, that we currently have, and uh, at its crux, um, that we, we are 
spending more to, to train a, a teacher in Northern Ireland than we are in terms of training engineers. Uh, we have too many teachers, we don't have enough engineers, so uh, there's something uh, not quite right uh, in, in that regard. We have uh, now completed the stage two uh, of that review, which maps out the options on the way forward. Uh, we are in discussions with the providers uh, around uh, diff the different models on, on the way forward. Those uh, discussions are still um, underway. Uh, and uh, I would expect, and indeed that there has been uh, some uh, robust and challenging comments made uh, to all of the, of the providers uh, in terms of those meetings. And that is the end to topical questions.